number three. It is good to be with you again this morning. It's always a pleasure to stand and to be able to preach God's word. It's an honor. It's also an awesome responsibility of having to break the bread of life, and we take this seriously. We don't take this lightly at all. It is something that God has uh, called us to do, and we do understand the severity of it. But as much as that being said, it's also necessary for the preaching to be heard. Not only is it going to be that I will be held an account one day of what I preached and how I preached, but you will also be held an account one day of what you heard and what you did or do with what you hear. And every word that is spoken, whether it falls on deaf ear or falls into good ground and takes root, Man shall give account by that one day. I do thank God for a complete word of God from Genesis to Revelation. I can stand here today, unapolog- I can't even get that word out, apologetically saying that I don't have a problem accepting and believing that I have the complete word of God in my hands up here today in the Bible. I do not believe there's lost books that are not contained because I believe my God is powerful enough that he put the whole book together that we needed from Genesis to Revelation. What about all of these other books, Brother Steve? Well, if they were inspired books of the Bible, I promise you that they would be in the Word of God because God promised through the book of Psalms to preserve his Word. And we just take God at his Word, folks. He cannot lie, and we know that we have the Word of God. If you would, just bear with me in reading this morning because I want to read all 18 verses of James chapter number 18. And to bring you up to where we are, James chapter number 1 deals with temptation and many other things that is there that the Apostle is writing about. And we need to understand that we see in Genesis chapter number 1, we are to be doers of the word, as the Bible says in James 1, not hearers only. And then you move into James chapter number 2, we find that that passage of scripture, that faith without works is dead. And then we move into another category that James is writing about in chapter 3, is about the tongue. Now I don't know how far in depth you are in your Bible study, but I do want you to understand Back in James chapter 1, we find that James is writing and talking to people about being not those that are double-minded and unstable, but those that uh, are solid in the Word of God, those that understand the Word of God, those that are solid in their faith. My friend, I want you to understand today that as we look into God's Word, I hope this is a profit to you, and it's not unprofitable that we will heed what we hear. He says in verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small hail, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. The tongue, excuse me, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body. And setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Every bee, every, for every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpent, of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith we, there, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, even or made, which, excuse me, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. 
Doeth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and of good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of the righteous in the and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word, and we pray that you bless it. And Father, we pray right now, Lord, that if it would be your will, Father, that we could just be a blessing to these people today. And Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, if there's anything in our lives that shouldn't be there, that, Father, you'd forgive us. And God, we just confess to you our wrongdoings and our shortcomings. And God, we realize today that as children of God, we fall so short, Lord. Father, we know through your mercy and your grace we can be, Lord, what you would have us to be. Father, I pray, that, Lord, that you would take this time, that, Lord, you would strengthen our walk with you, and, Father, that you would convict us of sin, Lord, that, that is in our lives, and, Father, that we would have the courage and the righteousness about us to confess it and forsake it. And Lord, I pray for the ones that are lost loved ones, Lord, you just touch their hearts this morning and comfort them. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus who died on Calvary's cross. Lord, was buried in that tomb, and Lord, three days later arose. And Father, for our victory, and Lord, for life eternal that you give us through Christ, that Lord, he was so powerful that even death, hell, and the grave could not keep. And Father, we pray, Lord, that each person sitting here knows him. And Father, we ask now, Lord, you receive all glory and honor for all things that are done and said. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It doesn't take long in reading this passage of Scripture to come to the conclusion that a proper title for a message being preached out of James chapter 3 could simply be entitled in two words, the tongue. You know, there are some people who say that this person has a loose tongue and that person has a loose tongue, but how damaging is the tongue among the members of our body? When you read here in James chapter number 3, you get the context of who James is talking to, and it's not just anybody. Here James is writing in verse number 1, he says, My brethren, be not many masters. And that word masters there in the Greek is a word for teachers. You had teachers of the day, and you had those wannabe teachers of the day, and you had those so-called teachers of the day. And he goes on to say, Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Why? Because to him that is given much, much shall be required. We understand that those that take on responsibility, those that take on leadership, those that take on positions that they're called to, there's going to be a great answering one day for what is said and what is done in the life of those who claim to be teachers. You turn your TV on today and you see many people who claim to be teachers who are teaching a false gospel, who are uh, teaching about a false Christ, who is teaching about a physical prosperity that are not talking about anything of eternal value. But yet you see here when James expressively speaks to the tongue, he's not only talking about those that are so-called teachers or those that are teachers, but those that are hearers also because we all have problems with the tongue. See, verse 2 says, For in many things we offend all. And there's a lot of things that people will do that is offensive to you. But the Bible says, if any man offend not in word, in tongue, or in speech, the same as a perfect or mature man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Now I want to bring in the context of what he's saying. Now you know there are a lot of people today that get offended at the preaching of God's word, the truths of it. This is not what he is talking about. There's been times that I've been offended at the preaching of God's word. 
what the preacher said, what the preacher was talking about, or what the Sunday school teacher was teaching. We got offended at that. That's not what he's talking about. Well, I'm going to tell you, I just didn't like what the preacher said from the Word of God today. I'm offended with him. There's only one simple explanation of that is get over it because God's Word is God's Word. But how many times have we offended in conversation or we offended in anger with our mouths? I want you to fully understand today that you have no legitimate claim to an offense from the Word of God in the speaking that a preacher or a teacher has said something from the Word of God and it made me feel uncomfortable, it made me feel bad, so therefore I'm taking offense to that. That is not in play today. But my friends, I do want you to understand something. That the Bible says that a man that, for in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and he's also able to bridle the whole body. How many times has somebody in a conversation offended you? How many times has somebody said something about you that was offensive? How many times has somebody come to you and they claim that someone said something about you and you were offended of it. Let me tell you something. Believe nothing you hear and half what you see. Get a hold of that today. Because I'm going to tell you people are bent on hell trying to get trouble started among folks today. You tell somebody something good, it will die where it was spoken. You speak something gooshy, you speak something that is against somebody, they will give it a life on its own. You want to know why? That speaks to the damnation nature that mankind has. Because they walk after the flesh and not after the spirit. The Bible says, James chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Behold, he gives an illustration or he gives a teaching about how to control something. And he says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Now, I looked at one illustration about this, and they say the average bit that goes in a horse's mouth weighs about one pound. And that one pound bit in the horse's mouth with the proper applied pressure can control a thousand pound beast in any direction you want him to go. That small, small bit pulling this way or pulling that way will turn that thousand pound body of that horse and make him do exactly what you want. And he says in verse number four, Behold also the ships which they be so great are driven of a fierce wind, yet they are turned about with a very small helm. You get to thinking about this. The size of the HMS Titanic was 839 feet long. The rudder on the Titanic or the helm was anywhere from 35 to 50 feet long, and you got that trying to turn 839 feet at almost 30 knots. That's why they hit an iceberg is because they didn't have time. But yet given in time, that rudder or that helm on the Titanic was enough to turn that big ship either left or right. See, something small has great power. And though our tongue be a little member, verse number 5 says, yet it boasts great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You heard me say this Wednesday night, and let me say it again. People tell you that words don't hurt, they do hurt. They do hurt. But you know what? One thing that bothers me is people who are constantly seeking words that hurt. What did they say about me? What are they talking about? They're talking about me. Listen to me. Some people have complexes today. Do we not realize the world does not go around us? It doesn't. It's not circling us. The world's not out to get you. The world's not out to get me. Listen to me. Every man and woman and child will face the same thing in life and it is being born into sin and what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? I have people tell me all the time, Brother Steve, they're talking about you. They're talking about you. They're talking about you. You know my attitude about this? If they're talking about me, they're leaving somebody else alone. Seriously. Seriously. And by the way, 
The Bible talks about gossips. The Bible talks about slanders. And if you're out there talking about somebody and you're gossiping about somebody, you are a gossip and a slanderer and you need to repent. Simple repentance would solve that. Simple. See, the tongue is little, but it boasts such a problem. Listen in verse number 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Guess what? The devil knows how to use our tongues. He does. He does. I'm often persuaded if we would spend as much time in prayer as we do about talking, complaining, and murmuring, we would see the world shaken for Christ Jesus. But you know what? Why does people rather talk about somebody than pray for somebody? It might be because they might be in an unregenerate state. They're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. You know, there are a lot of indicators from the Word of God that talks about the saints and the ain'ts. My friends, we need to understand those that are the saints, yes, they might be immature and some of them might be carnal as what we're learning in 1 Corinthians on Wednesday night, but there's enough Jesus about them to understand who they are. He says here in verse 6, and the tongue is a fire. What happens with a fire? You know, was it last year in La Cruz, New Mexico, or wherever it was, that the man got mad at the campground and he got mad at everybody and went out there with a small match and struck it and threw it into the straw and it began to burn and they said some 50,000 acres was torched before they got that fire out. And what did it start with? One little match. But look at what was consumed in its wake. tongue is a fire and it says a world of iniquity. If the tongue is not kept in check, if the tongue is not used to glorify God, if the tongue is not used to praise the Lord, if the tongue is not used to teach the things of God, my friend, you better watch out for it because a firestorm follows. See, the devil uses the tongue of people to destroy See, the Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, it's interesting, I was walking by Stephanie and Michelle's room this morning, and they were trying to pronounce the Hebrew word. It was kind of funny. I couldn't even pronounce it myself. It sounded like it started with a, uh, one of those sounds. And it's, I walked by, and you're, it sounded like a bunch of old guys sitting there going in there, and and. It's the word wisdom, and we're going to look at this a little bit today, this word wisdom and what we're talking about. It says, Proverbs, listen to this, 14, 6. A scorner. How does a scorner work? A scorner uses his mouth to scorn. Seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. But knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. See, there are a lot of people today that don't know anything about the Word of God or anything about the things of God that go to church, but they know everything they need to know how to scorn somebody. Oh, how amazing. And you wonder why you have so much trouble today in church over spiritual things. Because if they would conduct that mouth in the proper context of reading and speaking the Word of God, then maybe their tongue wouldn't be used in so much foolishness. It says, for every kind of beast and a bird and of serpent and things in the sea is tame and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I don't know if any of you have ever been bit by a snake or a spider or anything like that. You get bit by a brown recluse or however you say that. I get talked about after a while. Somebody tell me you didn't say that word right. It'll rot out a place in your arm. If you get bit on the arm or something, you have that big old place. If you ever get bit by a snake, people tell you king snakes don't bite. That's a lie. I pick up king snakes. I like to play with king snakes. They do have teeth. By the way, 
they got a lot of teeth. They just don't have two little fangs like a rattlesnake does. See, they're a type of a constrictor. They are a type of a these big snakes that they don't grow big. And they use all them little teeth when they open their mouth, start pulling their prey in. They can bite. But you know what? I'd rather be bit by a king snake any day than an eastern diamond bat rattlesnake. Amen? Because you're going to get some poison put in you by them. And I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of folks today that's got that poison right there. Right there. Right there. And the Bible tells us it is full of deadly poison. How many people, character, how many people today, testimonies, have been ruined by the tongue? Reminds me of the old story of the lady that didn't know what she was talking about that spread the word that the pastor's truck stayed over at the lady's house all night. And she had it all over town that he was there and the truck was there. I'm just wondering what our pastor was doing there in his truck. And he went to her and she wouldn't repent of it or anything like that because it was nothing. They had gone on a trip. So goes the song the next night, he went and parked his truck outside of her house and went home. See, sometimes you have to take care of foolishness with foolishness. You address it. And yet, today, we don't understand how evil, or don't want to understand how evil, and there's no telling how many times this stuff has taken place by way of, a prayer request. Brother Steve, we need you to be praying about so and so. I got news for you. If people were that concerned over prayer, they would be praying for the individual themselves. A lot of times people are just wanting Brother Steve or whoever it is to know what is going on. But we better be careful in that kind of stuff. Because when we point a finger, we need to understand something. we got plenty pointing back at us. Let's look a little bit farther. The Bible says here, James 9, 3, 9, Therewith, we, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Understand what he's getting here now. We walk in here and we sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. We walk in here and say, praise God, amen, glory to God. And then we walk out of this church and we go running somebody down. Folks, we don't see the dilemma that's there. That is ungodliness. Plain and simple ungodliness. If you have aught against your brother, what does the Bible say do? Well, they offended me, Brother Steve. That is the whole purpose. If you've been offended... What does the Bible say do? Go see them. But make sure you have biblical grounds when you go see somebody that an offense has occurred. You don't go out there running your mouth about somebody all over God's creation and then they have enough of it and then they say something back to you and oh, I'm so offended and hurt by what they said. Folks, that's ungodliness. That's ungodliness. That we set up in church, or anybody that sets in church anywhere, and we sing and we praise God. And then we go somewhere and run our brother or sister down. It's ungodliness. And if you're doing it, or if I'm doing it, it's ungodly. He says, James 3, verse 11. Let's go back to James 3, verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceeding blessing and cursing, my brethren, listen to who he's writing to, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Now, Brother Steve preaches exciting things, things that make us feel good. We've had a rough week. I tell you what, you start repenting and unload your sin, your week will get better, no matter what you face. I'm fully convinced today we don't need a motivational speech or we don't need encouragement. Today what the church needs in America is repentance of sin. 
We see what the motivational speakers are doing today, Joel Osteen and all that crowd. We see they've got thousands and thousands of coming. And Brother Steve, you are not saying anything about Joel Osteen. Why? Paul called him out in his day. Alexander the coppersmith has caused me much trouble. Joel Osteen and his crowd are leading people straight to hell's fire. And people are signing up for it left and right. You want to know why? Because Mr. Olstein is not going to touch their sin. He's going to make them feel good. He's going to tell you this is your best life. Now, I got news for him. If this is my best life now, then I, I'm in trouble. These things ought not so to be. James 3, verse 11, doeth a fountain send forth the same place, sweet water and bitter, it can't happen. Over in Alabama, on the Tom Beebe River, I remember as I was a child, we'd go fishing over there, they'd go catch catfish, and how this happened, I can't explain it, I just know it was there. They showed it to me, I tasted it. There is a well of water springing up there, and it is so bitter, you can't even drink it. But yet there's people who will wash their fish and clean their fish there, and they got a pipe, and it's just coming up out of the ground. Oh, take you a big swig. And I reached in, I turned that thing up, man, I was, <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> Guess what? It wasn't given fresh water and bitter water. It's not going to happen, sweet water. You could go right over here to where the bathrooms were in a water fountain. And guess what? There's a water fountain there and you drink it. It is sweet water. They was not coming from the same place. They were not coming there. They were coming from two different places. And this is what James is getting across. That sweet water and bitter is not going to originate in the same place. It's not going to happen. Can a fig tree, he goes on to another illustration, my brethren, bear olive berries or vines, figs, so can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. It's not going to happen. It ought not to happen. And then he says, who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. And this got very interesting to me. Turn with me, if you will, in your copy of God's Word to Proverbs chapter number 8. It's talking about what comes out of your mouth. And listen to what the writer of Proverbs says. This is what godly wisdom would do. Verse 1, it says, Doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? It's talking about talking here. Go down to verse number uh Verse number 6, Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips, and all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. Do you understand what the writer of Proverbs is saying? That a person in righteousness and godly wisdom is not going to be spewing these things out. So that brings us to question. Where do you stand with God? Where do you stand with God? See, verse 13 says, Who is wise man and dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. He's not going to be doing these things. But then verse 14, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Here's where we get to the heart of the matter. Listen to what it says. For if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts. What did Jesus say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Where did he say the Bitter envy and strife was in the heart. You want to know why so many folks run loose with their mouths about everybody and their murder? They got a heart problem. It's amazing how the Word of God will identify all of this and tie it all together and bring it right back. They got a heart problem. 
And it says here, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, glory not. Don't have pride about it. You hear people all the time, well, this and what, you're sinful. I'm going to tell them what I think. That is so wicked. That is so ungodly. Sure makes me feel good. Well, I'm glad you enjoy it now because you're not going to enjoy it. Jesus told the Pharisees, you better enjoy your reward today because the praise of men is all you have because there is no reward coming down the road. I mean, I don't understand where we get in this place in life that it makes us feel like we are above somebody, we're better than somebody, we know more than somebody because we can raise our voice louder or we can set somebody in their place or we can tell them off and everybody says, ooh. I mean, it's almost like going back to high school sometimes. It's amazing how everybody knows about everybody else's business but their own. But we're not talking about me. We're talking about you right now. Well, maybe we should be talking about you. Or maybe we should be talking about me. No, we shouldn't be doing the talking. We should let God be in the doing the talking to us and setting us straight where we are. See, if there's bitter envy and strife in our hearts, we're not to be filled with pride. We're not to glory. And we're not to lie against the truth. See, the Word of God teaches us that this is sinful. This is ungodly. This is unrighteous. That this wisdom that we think we have, James 3 verse 15 declares it not from above, but is earthly, sensual. And He gives us the key. It's devilish, so we know where it comes from. Verse 16, for where envy and strife is, guess what? There is confusion in every evil work. You hear about people in church all the time talking about that church is in confusion or everybody's confused or everybody's confused. There's a reason for that. When you have 300 miles running into all in different directions, you better understand there's going to be confusion. Well, we don't know if we can trust that guy. We don't know if we can, we can uh, trust that lady. We don't know what we can do. But I'm telling you one you can trust, and it's the Lord. And you can take him at his word because his word will never fail. His word will never come to naught. What goes out of his mouth will not return unto him void, Isaiah the prophet said. His word is truth and in him there is no lie. His wisdom is pure. Let's read a little bit farther. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. By the way, if we're walking through the Word of God and we're walking with God, the things that are not of God that are in us are going to be in a very uncomfortable place and we'll have to make a choice. Either I'm going to harbor these things and keep these things. David wrote about this. Uh, Lord, deliver me from presumptuous sins is what he said. Or do I want to hold on to them? He says, but this wisdom is from above. is first pure, then peaceable and gentle. And easy to be entreated, full of mercy and of good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. <coughs> Excuse me, very quickly. First, it's pure. God's wisdom, if we'll walk in it, is going to begin to purify us. There's things that, hey, you know, I do have a problem with anger, or I do have a problem with my tongue, but the Bible says the wisdom of God is pure, and I know what my tongue is doing, and I know the pride I have, and I know all of that. That's not of God. So either I keep it, or I repent of it and leave it. What am I going to do with it? Am I going to hold on to it? You're not going to walk with God. Secondly, what does it say? It is peaceable. How many people today do we know in church that do not have peace? And the Bible says, to them I give my peace unto them. 
There's a peace that passes all understanding. And you have people all the time, I don't have peace, preacher. Could it be that, number one, you're not saved, or number two, that you are saved, and there's things you haven't cut loose out of your life? Who in here today would testify anything wrong with playing baseball? Is there anything wrong with catching crappie? Is there anything wrong with deer hunting? Is there anything wrong with making chairs at Lazy Boy? Is there anything wrong with working at the bank? Is there anything wrong with cutting grass? Is there anything wrong with going out to eat? Is there anything wrong with going to a movie? The only thing wrong with any of that if it's not in its right place. There's nothing wrong with those things except them not being in their proper place. And a lot of people talk about, I have no peace in my life. You're either not saved or you're not walking in step with God. There's a lot of saved people that do not have peace. King David, when he committed adultery and murder, did not have peace with God at that time. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He prayed, take not thy spirit from me. There was no peace there. Why? Because here was all of this sin between him and God. But not only do we see it's first pure, then it's peaceable, then it's gentle. It's gentle. You know there's a time to be hard and firm. There's a time to be gentle. Have you ever known somebody that doesn't have a gentle bone in their body? Folks, there's mothers that I've met that don't have a gentle bone in their body toward their own children. They're gentle. Could you imagine the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, sitting there and the children were coming unto Him and the disciples and everybody were saying, no, get away from Him. Let the little children come unto Me. He was gentle, but yet... He had to whip and ran the money changers out of the temple. He was gentle, but when the Italian band came to receive him or to gather him up or to take him in the garden, there were 600 of them come with spears and torches and swords. Why? Because they feared him. gentle. Wisdom that is from above is pure, peaceable, gentle. Listen to this. It's easy to be entreated. Oh, living for God, Brother Steve, is such a sacrifice and it's so hard. No, it's a choice. Either I'm going to walk in the flesh or I'm going to walk in the spirit. And the reason that so many people have trouble with this being easily entreated is because they're wanting what the flesh wants instead of what the Spirit of God wants. One of the biggest problems you'll find, and Proverbs talks about this, is you'll give God the desires of your heart. God will redirect those desires, and your desires will become His desires. It says it's full of mercy and of good fruit. It's without partiality. How many times does preference take place in church among people? I'm with this group or I'm with that group or I like this group or I like that group. You could dig Adrian Rogers up and stand him in a pulpit. Thousands would show up to hear him say something. You take a man that loves the Lord and preaches the word of God. Adrian Rogers was that kind of man, by the way. Or let's let's re illustrate that. You take Joel Osteen and say he's gonna be downtown Newton. You couldn't get through Newton. The people that would show up 
You put Benny Hinn down there. Oh, we just want to be under Benny Hinn's shadow. I have a question about that, by the way. Benny Hinn heals all of these thousands of people. But you know it was just discovered this past week that Benny Hinn has been going to the doctor for the past, past 15 years with a heart condition. He can heal everybody else, but he can't heal himself. It's kind of amazing there, isn't it? It's without partiality and it's without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace in them that make peace. How do you use your tongue today? Is it used in the flesh or is it used in the spirit? Seriously. How do you use your tongue today? Pride dictates a lot of the way that we use our tongues. When a lot of times we speak when we should be silent. By the way, James chapter 3 is keyed off of James chapter 1, verse number 19. And let me read verse 19 out of James 1 for you. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Your mouth will carry you down a path one way or another. One way or another. When you feel like talking about somebody, how about getting on your knees and praying for them? When you hear gossip instead of repeating it, why don't you pray God forgive and God intercede? It would be amazing what things God could do if we would do the right thing. Because i got news for you. God's going to do one or two things. He's either going to bless something or He's going to condemn something. He's either going to pour His blessings out on it or His wrath out on it. One of the two. Be careful how you use your tongue. Be careful. Heavenly Father, as we come to you one more time, we pray, Father, you forgive us of our sin. And God, use this time we had together, Lord, convict hearts and convict us of sin. And Lord, we want you to receive all the glory and honor. And Father, I pray if there's one here lost, that Father, you'd reach down and stir their hearts. And God, I pray that Father, you'd help us to live and walk in your wisdom and be mature. We thank you for all that you've done for us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remember this song, Brother Mike. 244.